Welcome to our community conversation tonight. Um, I'm going to be your moderator. I'm Professor Chris Church. And the reason I want you to know um, my name is because we might be, you might have some questions that you want to ask without identifying yourself. And if you want to do that, all you've got to do is send a private message to me and I'll be recording questions for uh, later when we have our Q&A. But let me start by just saying that um, uh, everybody's muted so that we don't have any background noise, we don't have any feedback uh, during this time period together. Um, I'm gonna ask you, please leave your cameras on so that uh, Ms. Moss can see you, see your faces. It makes such a difference when we can see our um, attendants, uh, attendees. Um, I'm going to introduce our speaker and um, then uh, Ms. Moss is gonna introduce the topic. When she's finished with her presentation, there's gonna be time for questions and answers. So if you have some questions that you wanna ask and put them in the chat, then I'll keep track of those questions and we will address them during the Q&A session. Um, you're also welcome to raise your hand. Um, um, Haley, I'll watch for raised hands and let you know, so you don't have to watch for raised hands while you're presenting. Um, so, and also, uh, everybody ought to know that you do have the ability to have closed captioning. Um, on this presentation in the bottom left hand corner of your WebEx screen, you'll see the little looks like a little cartoon uh, balloon that says CC in it. And if you click on that, it's speech to text. It might not be 100% accurate, but it's it's going to be pretty good. So, um, okay, so let me introduce um, Haley Moss, it's it's my uh, very great pleasure to be able to do this. Um, Haley Moss is an attorney. She's also an author, an advocate, an artist, and she's a consultant who's passionate about disability inclusion and neurodiversity. Uh, diagnosed with autism when she was three years old, her personal and professional experiences allow her some unique insights and some perspectives across different professions and settings and, she, and and she uses those unique perspectives to help our world be more inclusive more accessible for people with disabilities while people with autism sometimes have difficulty with socializing Haley loves to share her story in hopes that it could make a difference in um, other people's lives uh, Haley Moss is the author of four different books uh, one on the middle school years one about college one about the transition to adulthood and independence, and one about neurodiversity for lawyers and other professionals. She writes about autism in various contexts, whether it's from personal experiences, media representation, politics, or how important it is to be heard and be part of the conversation. She believes the future is neurodiverse, the future is accessible, and the future is people with disabilities. And she's ready for the future now. So please join me in welcoming Haley Moss. Thank you, Haley. Thank you so much for having me and thank you everybody for taking the time out of your Thursday evening. I know that it is a busy time for a lot of us. I know that we have a lot going on. I know it's the summer. I truly, truly appreciate that. So first off, I just wanted to say thank you. And I'm so excited to get to chat about neurodiversity with everybody. I know that we're a pretty small and intimate group, so I'm going to try my best not to just completely dominate it. And before we get started, I'm actually going to get my screen up for you guys and get us sharing. So then we're ready to rock and roll. Let's see what we got going down here. So then I can pull up all my little controls. Let's see. There we go. We're going to and we're just going to talk about autism, neurodiversity, and also just being in this profession and law school. Like it's still wild to me that I'm only a couple of years out. I still have many friends who are current students and it's so, it feels like a long time ago and at the same time it does not. So it truly is great to be with everyone. Um, before we get started, I actually wanna talk about accessibility. It's something that came up really quickly while being introduced, but I really take inclusion seriously and look at access as a team sport. This is something we do together. It's not my job to 
hopefully be the one who gatekeeps what isn't isn't accessible for all of you. So this is a team sport that we create access together. So if I talk too fast, if there's something that I missed, if you have an urgent question, if there's something that I can do to make today more accessible to you, please let me know. And also I am very aware that some of you might just be tired because you're getting off of work. You might still be stuck in traffic or you might just also be hungry. If any of that stuff sounds familiar, this is a judgment-free zone. Please honor whatever it is that your brain and body need. That being said, some housekeeping that we are recording today and there are closed captions available to you. I am not a stickler about cameras. I know that it is viewed for many of us as a sign of respect. I personally do not care. I try to minimize my own face. I minimize most people's faces while I present because it makes me feel anxious to stare sometimes. And also I know there's many reasons that you might get distracted by your own face or you don't want folks knowing about like where you are or whatever reason you have. I personally think you do what makes today accessible to you. If you're busy, you have to fidget. I fidget a lot, my hands are always moving. Whatever it is, please do that thing. As for slide copies, I make it very clear that I want them to be accessible to everybody. So if you are someone who is blind or has a visual impairment, there should be alt text and screen reader, screen reader accessibility features built in. I try my best to write alt text. If it is not very good, you can please let me know because I would like to get better at it. One of those many things, if you do not know what that is, it is basically having some very nice image descriptions. So anytime that someone who is blind is accessing slides or digital content, they have it read out to them and it tells them what that is. So for instance, if there was alt text on what my face looks like right now, it would be something like Haley is a white woman with red hair and a Pink, pink lipstick and she's smiling. She's wearing this like ruffle shirt, for instance, like something like that would just be enough of a description. And then it'd be like, oh, okay, I get the idea. That's what Haley looks like. Cool. So without further ado, we're going to really just jump into things actually, because when we talk about neurodiversity, it's something that for a lot of us just feels kind of new. It feels kind of scary, kind of uncomfortable. And when we talk about neurodiversity, we're just saying that like any other person, we all have different brains is the way that we experience the world is wholly unique and wholly us based on how we experience things, the sensory things that we might feel and experience, just how we process information. For instance, I know that when we're here on WebEx or Zoom, for instance, you might not always be noticing a presenter or whoever speaking all the background noise or how bright the room is, for instance. So I am sitting at my kitchen table right now and I have one of those little scent diffusers off at the side somewhere mostly because I discovered a smell when I was at a hotel and I was like, I kind of want that. And they actually sold them these cute little cartridges. And I hear the fan whirring constantly all day long. Most people would probably not pick up on that, nor would they pick up on it probably in a virtual setting. But for me, I pick up on it in that extra ambient noise that shuts on and off every two or three minutes is kind of distracting. But most people might not notice that. That's kind of just my sensory system being really in tune to things. And when we talk about these different types of experiences that we have, they're wholly ours, and that no one truly has the exact same perception and experience. And all of our brains are different. We're not robots, we're not machines. So basically when we talk about having different brains, there's two major classes of people here. We have people who are neurotypical, and y'all that are neurotypical are people whose brains may act quote unquote normal, whatever normal is supposed to mean, and in these expected ways. And then there are the folks who are neurodivergent, whose brains might be a little bit more outside the box and might be more unexpected per se. And a lot of these forms of neurodivergence really do include these differences in how we communicate, how we think, how we process information, sensory differences, et cetera. And neurodivergence covers a huge swath of different people. There's kind of this belief that it is just another fancy word for autism. That is not true. Neurodiversity includes every single one of us, but neurodivergence really does include and encapsulate a whole host of experiences, including our friends, colleagues, loved ones, whoever with autism, ADHD, learning disabilities, Tourette's, intellectual disabilities, psychiatric and mental health conditions, as well as our acquired cognitive disabilities like a traumatic brain injury or things of that nature as well. And I know these things always seem kind of unrelated, but all of them affect cognition and how we perceive problem solve, communicate, and think. That is not diversity of thought. We're really getting at just how stuff happens in our brains. And I want to use this very expansive definition of neurodiversity on purpose. As many of us know from being in law school and entering this profession, we want to uplift people who may not have access to justice or who are the most marginalized. And when we talk about disability, when we talk about neurodiversity and we talk about stigma, some of the people who face the most stigma 
and have the least amount of access are people with intellectual disabilities and people with mental health conditions. So for me personally, I try my best to uplift those folks whenever I get the chance. And also something else is someone may be multiply neurodivergent. So you might be autistic with ADHD, or you might be an ADHD -er who also struggles with anxiety, for instance, that there's no one perfect experience or that you can't have multiple different experiences happening at the same time. It definitely makes things interesting. It's like kind of having a party in your head to put it the nicest way, because I feel like that is the easiest way to be like, oh, I have different competing access needs. Like as an autistic person, my life is very routine driven. I like routine. It keeps me regulated. And I also struggle very much to set one and stick to it. So it is probably something else going on because I don't have a great explanation for why that is. But that's a whole other story. Just something to kind of think about is that there's more than one way to be neurodivergent if not multiple ways at the same time. And this affects a lot of us. So when I give this one in seven number, it usually feels like a lot or not that many. And then when you think about how many people have disabilities under the ADA definition of a physical or mental impairment that limits major life activities, essentially, that is one in four people. When we think about who has cognitive disabilities, it could be a lot more narrow than that, but still pretty common, especially when we include mental health. So there's a lot of neurodivergent people. Chances are somebody you already work with or somebody you already know or your clients are. It's something that when I look back on law school, I wish I had had more time to get to know about, especially for my friends who did clinical experiences and often did represent neurodivergent and disabled people and would often come to me for advice because they didn't know how to handle things like an individualized education plan or what accommodations they should be making. And at the same time, I wish that they had had information that didn't just come from my personal experiences. Just something to kind of noodle on when we talk about neurodiversity and what this exactly all means. And when we think about our profession, our profession has lots of neurodivergent people within it. We're just not very good at talking about it. We're not good at talking about disability more broadly in law practice. So I know we're all very excited to eventually get out, enjoy the profession. If you're already an attorney, this is probably stuff you're thinking about too. But when we think about who lawyers with disabilities are today, we make up less than 1% of the population of the profession. And this has been true for several years now. And that's who's self-reporting. And self-reporting is kind of the biggie here. I know that many of you, especially students, are nervous if you do have a mental health condition, there's a lot of stigma surrounding it. There's a lot of fear about reporting during the bar application process and bar admissions. There's so many reasons that folks don't disclose. No matter what your reason is, you are valid and we will try our best to unpack that together too. But what really happens is the data that we have is also a very different story is we know how much lawyers and law students love mental health and well-being initiatives. I have very fond memories of the therapy dogs coming to campus and all of us being told about what services are available to us. And what was really interesting when the ABA did their landmark mental health study a couple of years ago, they really focused on anxiety, depression, and substance use disorders. Three of the things that kind of affect law students and lawyers the most. But what really happened somewhere in this study is there was this statistic about ADHD that shows up this 12.5% having or meeting the criteria for an ADHD diagnosis. And you know what the study does? Nothing. It never mentions it again. But they mention the statistic and it stands out like a sore thumb and it shows that we have this neurodiversity within our profession, but we haven't exactly addressed the needs, for instance, of neurodivergent lawyers or lawyers with ADHD. We're just so focused on depression, anxiety, and substance use that we don't realize that there might be something else or perhaps impulse control related issues to ADHD might be driving substance use. We don't really know all sorts of different things to be kind of thinking about. And as a whole, lawyers with disabilities, we kind of get the short end of the stick. We are more likely to be unemployed, not to scare you if this is you. And on average, the entry level starting salaries for lawyers with disabilities are lower. I believe reading somewhere on average, that number could be about $10,000 for entry levels in recent grads. Thankfully, we have all sorts of great resources that we should be using and taking advantage of to combat some of these disparities. But best off is we benefit from having unique problem solving and different approaches to different things. Is the way that our brains work, we might be more creative. We might've had to adapt our entire lives and have strategies and ideas that help us with legal issues and whatnot as well. Something that 
I learned is that even if it seems like you might be weird or some failed version of normal type lawyer, you might be the perfect lawyer for a specific client. You might have that extra empathy. You might know what it is that they went through. My one all summer, I remember representing this young woman with epilepsy. And I was the intern who was assigned on her case most often. And she trusted me for some reason. And I think it was because both of our life experiences were fairly similar and that she's like, you get it. And that's a huge thing is having someone who gets it. So if any of this sounds like something that's you, I want you to know that you have a friend in me and somebody who gets it. I feel very strongly about that because when I was in law school, I did not know any neurodivergent lawyers or attorneys until nearly the end of my 3L year. And I wished I had known that I was not alone. But really, this is one of our profession's greatest strengths. And it's something that we do kind of a bad job about. We tend to squander it especially when it comes to all sorts of different things. And when we think about the employment context with every other industry, they are really trying to harness the power of neurodiversity. That if you read all sorts of interesting things from like Forbes or the Harvard Business Review, you'll see that neurodiversity is a competitive advantage. This is helping drive their inclusion strategy. We're doing this. We're having all these amazing tech savants and things. And you'll see that they're doing things like they did at SAP, where they're creating technical fixes that save them millions of dollars, that they'll say that neurodiverse teams are more productive, that when they, when companies, firms, and everybody hires people with disabilities more broadly, they make more money. I know that certain firms out there are partners with different disability organizations and inclusion initiatives and do actually hire people on the autism spectrum and with different intellectual and developmental disabilities through programs like Best Buddies, for instance, but not nearly enough seem to be truly active in the space. We also just feel good about supporting folks who do include people with disabilities in our community. I know that as Floridians, a lot of us probably love going to Publix. So my local Publix is very good and has a lot of cashiers and deli counter folks, et cetera, with autism, with Down syndrome, all the good stuff. And there's been a cashier with Down syndrome at the Publix that I go to. And I've seen him probably multiple times a week at one point, because he's been there for a couple of years now. And I go to Publix more than once a week at this point. And I feel good every time I see him. He always says, hi, Haley, how are you doing? Like, very happy to see me because we see each other every week. And it makes me feel good about supporting Publix, knowing that there's this person in my community who's earning a fair wage, who has a job in the community, who's clearly being supported, who's clearly has this sense of belonging. And of course, we benefit from working with people who are different than we are, that it's not confirming all of our different in-group biases. And we have that creativity and unique perspective that who wouldn't want that? And of course, we have our massive disparity. So I talk a lot about autism and employment primarily because that's the experience I know. And also with other intellectual and developmental disabilities because we're in that same category. And a lot of us end up unemployed, especially the more educated that we are. It's really frustrating. And a lot of folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities are not paid. There's many reasons for salary disparities, for unemployment, for low pay, whether it's affecting disability benefits, whether it's discrimination, ableism, all sorts of different things. But it's definitely something to be thinking about and something I know that scared me as a young person. It scared me as a law student. It scared me as a college student. I'm like, oh my God, I'm like never going to get a job. That is not true. You are still worthy and you are still absolutely going to make your mark in this world if this is also you. It just is very frustrating that most people do not want to look past a diagnosis or realize that there is limitless potential within the neurodiversity space, that there's so many folks who are ready, willing, and able to work, to help out, to do all sorts of things and aren't often given the chance to even show what they know. Hopefully our profession will be change makers and do better about that. And here's a part of why that happens. We have our stigma and our microaggressions. I know we talk about this a lot when we talk about different diversity topics of different versions of stigma, different versions of microaggressions that we may face and things like that. But I always like to pick my top three because these are things I probably hear at least once a week. And the first one is usually pretty straightforward is this, well, you know, everybody's a little bit autistic, we're all on the spectrum. And usually this is meant pretty well intentioned is it's a way that's meant to make it seem like the things that I struggle with day in and day out aren't that hard or that bad because everybody kind of struggles with that. 
one of the biggest things for me that I struggle with day in and day out is executive functioning, which is basically your brain's ability just to get stuff done. If there is no calendar invite, it doesn't exist. I do not always respond to things. I unfortunately, I'm not always great about deadlines unless I know that it's a firm deadline. I try very hard to do all of these different things and things that have too many cognitive steps. Sometimes I get very, very overwhelmed. Take, for instance, keeping my apartment clean. I know this seems like most 20 something young people that don't want to clean their house. The difference is when I say that, yeah, I struggle keeping my apartment clean. You might be like, well, yeah, everybody, no one wants to clean their house. But here's the thing. I do want to clean my house. I just struggle because there are so many products and so many different steps that I start getting it together and then I just get straight up overwhelmed and then nothing happens because I got frustrated and like freaked out by how many different cleaners, how many different steps, how many different rooms, what needs to be done that it just doesn't happen. That is not the same as, you know, I just don't feel like it. And I think that's where that gets lost. But this idea of everybody's a little autistic is also really interesting to me. Because I do kind of wonder if when I do say things like that and people really relate, if that these social standards that we're all held to from neurotypical society just make it hard for everybody to feel like they can be themselves or that everybody's really struggling because there is this societal and social and cultural expectation of how we should be behaving and what we should be doing and what we should be good at and everybody falls short that it ends up hurting all of us. But I think most people aren't quite at that philosophical level when they say this to me. <laughs> it's just something that I've been thinking about a little bit more over the last couple of months of like, well, maybe there's no such thing as neurotypical. Who really knows? But we don't have a perfect answer to any of these things. One of the easiest one and probably something you may have said to your peers at some point is something like, well, why don't you just get that? It's so easy. Oh, boy. There are a lot of things that I'm good at. There are also a lot of things that I am bad at. They are probably not the same things that you are good at and the same things that you are bad at. For instance, it took me until I was 12 to tie my shoes. If you told me that tying your shoes is like the easiest thing in the world and I'm 12 years old and can't figure it out, I'm kind of going to feel bad about myself. The same also goes for when you're working with someone new in practice or whatever it might be. And you're like, well, everyone can write a memo. You did that one all year. It's so easy. <laughs> and someone's still struggling because maybe... It's a new routine. Maybe the partner's expecting something different than they already know. Maybe it's a learning curve. Maybe their brain makes it that they over like hyper focus or get distracted. That maybe it's not easy for them. So be gracious because something that might be easy for that person might be really hard for you and they're not rubbing it in your face either. The last thing that is on my greatest hits is probably the thing that I've heard my entire life, in fact, is when folks say something like, I never would have known if you didn't tell me. And I think I get this one primarily because people assume that Autism and neurodiversity has a certain look to it. It doesn't. Nope, no specific look. So what happens here, what I end up feeling is you notice that I have a lot of different coping skills that I use in my life. I attempt to make eye contact by looking at your nose. I do all sorts of things. I usually know what's cool in pop culture, even if I don't always care because I have something to talk about and I'm able to kind of script that interaction, all sorts of different coping mechanisms to be perceived as confident. And you're just telling me I'm really good at that. And it makes me feel kind of sad sometimes because I feel like I can't always be myself. But all these things, even if they're well-intentioned, come from this idea of ableism. And ableism is this really complicated social system that assigns value to us based on these ideas of who is smart, who is fit, who is intelligent, who is productive, who is worthy, who is employable, all of these different things, who is fit to reproduce, whatever it may be. That is a really complicated system. And attorney scholar activist T.L. Lewis does a really wonderful job describing it and then also goes further with that system of ableism of assigning worth to our bodies and brains based on some of those factors of saying how it comes from eugenics, it comes from anti-blackness, it comes from colonialism and capitalism and all sorts of other things as well. But the simple definition of ableism is this idea of prejudice, stereotypes, and discrimination that often is against people with disabilities. And you do not also have to be disabled or neurodivergent to experience this. You might have been treated differently because you are friends with somebody with a disability or maybe your family members are. I know my family members have been treated differently because of me. I also know that there are times that we kind of keep that stigma going when we say things like, oh my gosh, I'm so ADHD, when you in fact do not have ADHD or that you just assume that you're lazy and all sorts of different things, that it's kind of a messy system and we're gonna try to unpack some of the other stuff with it. But most of what this comes from is this idea that something is wrong with us and that we're failed versions of normal and that we're broken people that need to be fixed to act more neurotypical. 
And as we're learning, that's not necessarily the case of what's really going on. And we're not broken people. It's like having an Android and an iPhone. And what we're doing, if I tell you that my iPhone runs this really cool app and you want to try it out on your Android, you're going to say, you know, it's just not compatible. But if we did the equivalent with neurodivergent people, we go, you know, I think your phone might be broken. Let's take a look at that that we get treated very differently on the basis of diagnosis and identity. And it's frustrating at times, but I have faith that we can actually do better. And that's why we're here, right? Because we want to maybe learn something, maybe ask some questions, maybe realize, oh wait, this is me. And I didn't realize I had a community. And if that's you, that is also the coolest thing that you can get out of these conversations. And probably the thing I look forward to the most to be quite honest. Let's keep our ableism thing kind of running. So I know at the beginning of today, we talked a little bit about accessibility and I did that on purpose. And ultimately when we talk about our ableism, a lot of it is based on how we treat people, how we make assumptions and all sorts of different things. I have been learning quite a lot more about ableism because I also have friends with physical disabilities who experience this very differently than I do. That their versions of ableism might be that there's no ramps or different accessibility things. Even the fact that we have closed captions and we're recording today, that opens our conversation to so many different folks that may have otherwise had trouble accessing it, maybe because of a hearing impairment, their time, maybe they need more time to process things, maybe they're a second language learner, et cetera. But when we talk about this as a complicated thing, ableism is also very intertwined in our culture. A lot of the easy, actually, let me back up. The easiest place to spot ableism is within the language that we use. If you want a fun challenge, you can stop trying to say words that are negatively associated and ableist towards people with mental health disabilities and intellectual disabilities. A non-exhaustive list of these is things that I am trying to unlearn to say in my regular life, and it is very, very hard. So think of things like crazy, insane, moron, imbecile, stupid, dumb, etc. Like a lot of these words are very hard to unlearn because you hear them every single day in a variety of different contexts and I use them quite a bit too. I am not shaming you if that is you because that is probably most of us. I am saying that a lot of these things have ableist connotations in history. So if you think about words like moron, they actually were different classes to grade intelligence and were often used against people with with intellectual disabilities and eugenics in this country. So that's a really fun thing to kind of revisit. I know a lot of disability history, if you're someone who gets really geeky about it, is really not that sexy. It's actually pretty dark and pretty scary. And at the same time, we're a community of fighters. So it is something I'm personally very proud of. But when we think about ableism being internal and external, it could be that kind of subconscious thing that's in our culture. It could be internalized in that you think that you're asking for too much or that you're not smart and that you're lazy, all sorts of different things. It's something I personally am working a lot through and we will talk about internalized ableism in a couple more minutes in detail because it's just something that's a mess for a lot of us, myself included. But think about when we do things like this and what is and isn't accessible. And even on the basis of neurodiversity that maybe firm life isn't accessible for different reasons or how that having this in a virtual space versus a physical space might make it so more people have access in ways that maybe we weren't considering. Which brings me to this idea of benevolent ableism, which is probably where most of us fall into. This is something I know that I am guilty of. I know it is something that other people do all the time. And when I talk about benevolent ableism, it's very well intentioned, which makes it difficult. Is that oftentimes with this, it's what happens when people offer assistance or make assumptions that end up taking away a person's autonomy or decision making power in a way that isn't very helpful that it's often when I get help that's not wanted nor needed. So kind of like we have this nice little graphic of this girl getting pushed off a bus in her wheelchair by a guy who insists on helping her like a total superhero and she's like totally not having it. And she's like, I didn't ask you to do that. Or at least she's thinking it and she doesn't wanna be rude and say no, but she might've said no. Either way, he obviously means well cause he wants to give help and things like that. But I always tell people, just ask us what we need or if we got this. And if I say that I got this, then chances are I probably do. I get offered lots of things that are supposed to be for my benefit and honestly are not. So case in point, I know that it is evening. I know that probably a lot of us are gonna go get dinner after we're done if you are joining us live. So what would happen in this 
classic benevolent ableism situation. Okay, how many people are we? We're probably like a small enough group. We could reasonably all go out to dinner later. We can all get pizza together. We, if we were in person, we'd probably have pizza, right? So let's just pretend after this, we're going to have pizza. And we have one friend or colleague who's in attendance and we, we care about this person, okay? We care about everyone. We love everybody here. But we have one colleague here who does not like pizza. What are we going to do? In a benevolent ableism situation, what's going to happen is we're not going to invite that colleague. That sounds kind of scary, doesn't it? We're just not gonna invite this person. And we like this person, that's what's gonna make this funny. So we like this person, we don't invite them because they don't like pizza for whatever the reason. And we have our pizza party together. We have a great time. We're very happy. We're talking, all this stuff. And then tomorrow comes. Our colleague knows we excluded them. Maybe they saw a photo of all of us together on Instagram. And our friend comes up to us and says, why didn't you invite me? And us being the absolute fantastic friend that we are goes, you know, we really care about you. And you know you're one of our closest friends, right? And our friend sits there and goes, mm-hmm but we know you didn't like pizza and we thought you wouldn't want to come is what we say back. Now, it sounds thoughtful, right? We know this person doesn't want this or that it might be difficult for them for whatever the reason, maybe they're allergic, maybe the pizza place is too loud, I don't know. Let's just invent some reason. It doesn't really matter what it is. But what we ended up doing is we took that decision-making power away that maybe that person wants to join us even if they don't have any pizza with us. Maybe they just want to enjoy our company or maybe we're right. Maybe they just don't like it and they're not interested. In that case, they could say, I really appreciate you thinking of me, but I'm going to skip out on this one. I'll see you guys tomorrow, okay? That's one of those things that happens to me more often than you can imagine. It sounds like something that we know not to do, but it's something that happens a lot. And as far as our other little example of this benevolent ableism is this beautiful Minds Wasted headline from The Economist a couple of years ago that made me kind of scratch my head when it came out, is... It means well because it's saying that we're very talented, we have these beautiful minds, but it also is kind of harmful because it's saying that it's a, that we're wasting our potential or our minds and how to deal with autism. Like we're a problem that needs to be solved. Not how to, I don't want to be dealt with. I want to be treated like a person. I want to be in collaboration. I want to be supported. I want to be empowered. I want to have all of these other things. I don't want to, I'm not someone or something to be dealt with. I'm, it just, it doesn't sit well with me, to put it quite honestly. And then in our third class of little ableism things, we have our internalized ableism, which is probably the thing that law school taught me more than anything else, to be quite honest with you. Because in law school, I genuinely thought, because I did not study in the same way and take notes in the same way, because I struggle so much at taking notes in any meeting or any class or any anything that I just, I couldn't do it. And I didn't know that I can ask for note taking as one of my accommodations. I did not know very much as a 1L. I was 21 years old. I am learning to have a lot more grace towards 21 year old me for not knowing these things that she probably should have known or had had the resources to know what to ask for. And it's when you begin to believe all this negative stuff about your own condition. So I remember thinking, I'm lazy, I'm dumb, I'm a burden for asking for help, I'm not good enough, I have to be superhuman. That's the one that I'm still struggling with is this idea of being superhuman. I was giving a training to a bunch of special education teachers this morning, and they were like, how do you balance everything? And I'm sitting there thinking, that's a great question, because the only reason I don't know how to balance anything is because I feel like I have to do all the things because unlike most people, neurodivergent and disabled people do not get the presumption of competence. We have to prove that we are competent in almost every professional situation. So me not thinking that I was good enough because of my disability or thinking I'd get passed over for it, felt like I had to be superhuman. You bet by 2L year, I was on multiple executive boards. I joined journal. I did a fellowship. I had a judicial internship. I was lining stuff up like nobody's business. I had a summer job lined up at the fall. I was all over my action trying to be superwoman because I know if I took this kind of, it's okay to be just average and have a life, that I would get passed over because of my disability. I'm very open about it. And I realized that I do not have to be superhuman. I don't have to do this so people think that I'm exceptional, that I can still just be myself without having to do that. And that's something that's very difficult to unlearn. And I'm still learning to do it by saying no to things, by setting boundaries, all sorts of stuff that I think probably a lot of us struggle with. But when it's an internalized ableism thing or that you're not worthy of something, it's 
it's an interesting mess to be reckoning with and it takes time and I'm still working on unlearning a lot of this. And if this is also you, I, I'm here for you. It's valid. And I want to give you a hug to be quite honest with you, but I want us to think about something else. Now that we have these things, like, how do we get the tools to do better? How do we get to what we need? How do we actually have access when we get to the profession and beyond? And a lot of that is accommodations. And I know when we're in school, we have a very different view of how we get accommodations that there's probably disability services, but once we get out in the world, it's a lot more complicated and employers have a very different take on this. So a lot of this is stuff that happens under the Americans with Disabilities Act and Title I, which applies to any business with 15 or more employees. The same also goes under Florida state law. And basically what that means is that you are entitled to a reasonable accommodation if you are a qualified individual with a disability. So it is pretty simple unless it's an undue hardship, which means it like massively changed the job, it's overly expensive or it's just impossible to implement. That's kind of the plain language version of the legal jargon. And most people have this kind of fear of accommodations. That is something that's very heavily stigmatized as it's viewed as some unfair advantage or something really, really expensive. If you are interested in learning more about accommodations and kind of the processes or sample ideas, things that I wish that I had had access to and thought about once upon a time, the Job Accommodation Network is a fantastic resource. That's askjan.org. It's run by the Department of Labor. They have all sorts of amazing ideas and things that you can do on a disability and condition basis. I am kind of obsessed with it. Also, most accommodations are pretty cheap. Most of them are free or low cost. And the average one time cost is about $500 for most employers. And every single one of us who is neurodivergent has different needs. It is always very much assumed that the accommodations I need are like some squish balls and like sensory friendly everything. But really, the things that help me the most are when I have firm deadlines, clear instructions, and ideas of what's urgent, what's important, things of that nature. So, how do we have this conversation? How do we get there? I look at accommodations as the ultimate exercise in advocacy. I know we're all training to be advocates and we kind of aren't great at advocating for ourselves. What I like to do is have an honest conversation with whoever I'm working with, because it makes it a lot easier. Even though if you work somewhere bigger, you can eventually just go to human resources and go through a whole process. And that will probably be explained to you, or it will be in like an employee handbook when you get onboarded. But what I usually do, especially if I work closely with a supervisor or something, I might just say like, it's really helpful if you send me a calendar invite or the agenda for our meeting in advance. Like that might be all I say, because I might not have disclosed that much information about my autism for whatever that reason may be. Or it might be something like my office has fluorescent lights and they hum all day and I'm nervous because I hear that humming and it distracts me. In which case I was allowed to wear headphones when I worked in the office and I just kept the volume low enough that I can hear the phone ring because that's what they asked me for. And I just was able to tune out the thing that absolutely made it so I couldn't focus and do my job very well. And that, of course, did not cost my employer anything. It was very cool. So accommodations are so individualized and try not to generalize based on your experience or someone else's. And if you really wanna think about accommodation stigma or you're afraid of this, do not look at it as an unfair advantage. You are just leveling the playing field. I would like to think of this as leveling the playing field, especially because there's probably at least one person here who wears glasses or contacts, and you are basically using an accommodation for your visual impairment and nobody thinks twice about it. You do not have supervision like this, or you don't, you can't like shoot lasers out of your glasses or contacts, but if you could, please let me know, because that would be extremely cool. I'm just saying. So yes, we have to do a better job normalizing this or just making everything universally accessible. So then we don't have to have this conversation about accommodations in the first place. Which brings us to this idea of disclosure, because at least under the law, you have to disclose if you are getting an accommodation, pretty much. Like you have to disclose a disability to receive an accommodation. So I like to look at disclosure and when we talk about this authenticity and neurodivergence and neurodiversity, as you have two camps of people. You have people who disclose voluntarily and get really, really excited. And you have people who do it when they feel boxed into it. So the folks who feel boxed in usually are failing at adapting by themselves. They legally do need an accommodation. There's an issue with communication or performance, or you had a change in life circumstances, like you just got a diagnosis, 
or you were like one of my friends in law school who suffered a traumatic brain injury her one all summer and it affected her ability to do most of her clinic work and other things and she had to say hey this happened to me and i am not the same because of it the voluntary disclosures like yours truly are people who want to bring their full selves into everything they do there is such thing as disability pride so if you are not someone who is in the neurodiversity and disability communities now that we are in July, it's actually Disability Pride Month. We celebrate this every year in honor of the anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. It is very nerdy. It is very fun. I also love that my community has this kind of ownership of who they are. I also like to be proactive and limit my misunderstandings. I miss a fundamental social cue at least once a day, and I like to make sure that I'm proactive about it. Also, I view my neurodivergence as a strength, and I know I'm not the only one who feels this way either. And if I view it as something that's a good thing about me, I'm going to share that because it makes me unique. Maybe it's how I solve problems. Maybe it's how I adapt or that I'm creative, whatever it might be that I think it might be an advantage to whoever I know. Or I just want someone to know this because I think it's important or it's a fun fact. If somebody tells you that they are neurodivergent and you have no clue what to say, just thank them for telling you and ask how you can be supportive. I know that sounds like a silly thing to do, but a lot of us might not have all the information that we want to have on hand. So I know whenever someone tells me, like, I have OCD, for instance, like if someone says that to me, I might not know the ins and outs of OCD or what this person wants me to do with that information. I don't know if they want me to help them get an accommodation. I don't know if they just want me to know that, like, as a fun party fact. I don't know if it's something that they've just never said out loud and now they feel comfortable. So I will always just say, I appreciate you sharing that with me or thanks for telling me because I know it is awkward to disclose. And I might just say, is there anything I can do to be supportive? And usually that might lead to, I need help with an accommodation or no, I just wanted you to know, or I'll let you know, thanks. Like, just don't be weird about it, essentially. <laughs> People usually like to ask really invasive questions and it makes me regret disclosing in a lot of situations, to be quite honest. I don't appreciate when I disclose and somebody's like, so I watched Love on the Spectrum on Netflix. Do you only date autistic people? I'm not kidding. Someone has actually done that to me recently. So please don't be that person. I know it sounds like common sense. I know most of us are trying to be professional. And a lot of us are also just curious about experiences that we don't have, but please don't do that. Please don't be that person that asks about love on the spectrum in my dating life because you are curious and you are not friends. If you would not ask about the dating life of a complete stranger, do not ask it to me. I think that is a pretty reasonable kind of baseline. But then again, professionalism and lawyers if you've ever read any of the professionalism case law it can be questionable what people's idea of professionalism is but i just think treat me like any other human being and we're off to a really good start which brings me to this idea of openness anyway so i talk a lot about being open about my own autism and my own experiences and for me it means that i can be fully myself and i realize that is a huge privilege that I am very open. I am very aware that people might treat me differently because of it. But I'm also very thankful that most of the people that I work with and most of the people that I know at this point in my life are very accepting, very kind, and usually happy to help me or offer me lots of help that I don't need and want and I want them to hopefully do a little bit better about. But generally speaking, I feel very grateful for the life that I have and the folks who are supportive and that I do love and who love me and care about me. So that has been a very fun journey. I mostly am open at this point in my life because I've been open since I was a teenager. I started writing and speaking as a kid and teen. And I was like, well, it's kind of out there on the internet anyway. I might as well just own my own story instead of just have it as this open secret that people are hush hush asking questions about behind my back. I'd rather them ask questions to me or have information straight from the source. So there's all sorts of information and things that I've written over the years. I love to tell stories. I will tell you all about, like, even when I was shopping for professional clothes, which ones are the itchy blazers and stuff. Like, that's the kind of stuff that I love that I get to share with other, like, autistic and neurodivergent students. Like, oh, this is the, the brand of clothes that causes me, like, sensory overloads. And this is the brand of blazer that is the most comfortable. And also here is a pair of pants that look professional but feel like pajamas. You're welcome. Like, that is kind of my jam at this point. I love that I can actually help people and that when we do have that community, things like that are pretty normalized of like, oh, accommodation you didn't know that you needed, but you will be grateful that you have it. Which brings us to kind of our shift to self-advocacy. I know that we are all advocates. It is from personal experience, much easier to advocate for a corporation and much easier to advocate for another human being 
than it is to advocate for Y-O-U. So self-advocacy is one of these things we talk a lot about in neurodiversity, autistic, and disability communities. But really when we talk about it, it's this skill set and this movement. And as a movement and whatnot, it basically empowers people with disabilities to make choices that affect their daily lives and allow them to be more independent. And think about how as this idea that we're speaking for ourselves, we're speaking alongside others and really taking control of our lives. All of us do this every single day. We make constant choices, right? And all of you chose to be here tonight, which is fantastic. So thank you again, that that was something that you advocated for yourself. Maybe you advocated to leave work early or you skipped something else or you postponed having dinner with your family, whatever it might be, that you still made a choice because that was taking control over your life because you wanted to be part of a conversation or you wanted to learn. That we all do different forms of advocacy for ourselves and we also do this a lot in every other portion of our lives. Think about this. We love setting boundaries. Setting boundaries is kind of the big one of self-advocacy. But think about how we can do this in a professional context too. And how I like to look at this is how we advocate for ourselves in professional settings. And a lot of that is how we have our accommodations conversations. Is like how we think about, this is what works for me. This is how I work best. If you really don't know what to say and you're trying to advocate for yourself, do some fill in the blank scripts. I really like doing things like, I work best when you give me clear instructions, fill in the blanks. Or it is really helpful when you do X. It is really helpful when you attach an agenda to your calendar invite. Okay, I don't really think anything of it. When I say that stuff, it's also a soft disclosure. So if you do not feel like admitting, say you have ADHD because you're still getting a diagnosis or you just never said it out loud to another person or you're afraid how they're gonna react, you don't have to say it when you use these types of scripts. It's kind of like a nice little cheat sheet for the time being. I, so if I say I work best when you give me clear instructions or it's really helpful when you send me a follow-up email. When I say it's really helpful if you send me a follow-up email, I'm not saying, Please send me a follow up because my brain is a dumpster fire and there's a very good chance that I will mentally hit send and not physically hit send. And also there's a good chance I won't get back to you within 7 business days. Like, I am not saying that and then going, oh, by the way, that's because of my autism. Like, I don't say any of that. But if I say it's really helpful if you send a follow, it would be really helpful if you can send a follow up and please don't think you're bothering me. And then people will actually do it and they don't need to know why, or I don't feel comfortable sharing that. Why? Like, I just might have said with you. So that's something that you can do if you want to practice this. It's a great little skill set to have. I also like to decide who I disclose to and who needs to know how much information. And a lot of this is because disclosure is very personal. The, the amount of information I give you about my autism is something I very much control. That the information that I give you might be very different than the information my family has, very different than the information my friends have, very different than my former manager, and very different than, say, somebody I might go on a first date with. Like, it just is a very different conversation if that conversation or conversations happen at all. You have to kind of weigh the pros and cons as well as who knows. So sometimes my colleagues were suspicious that I was getting special treatment, so I felt like I had to tell them, like, I'm not getting special treatment. I just have an accommodation due to a disability, and I felt like I just had to leave it there because I did not like being talked about behind my back. Something else that's really cool is we can advocate for different solutions and policies that benefit everybody. One of the first places I worked had a, had a fragrance free policy, meaning no perfume and no cologne. And I found out that, that policy existed because somebody had allergies. I thought that was extremely cool and extremely considerate. And I realized that not only would it help someone with allergies, but also people with different sensory sensitivities or other different disabilities as well. I thought that was really cool. And eventually that policy, I believe, was amended to make it clear that it was just fragrances like colognes and perfumes and not also things like deodorant because no one wanted you to basically smell like BO. But that was kind of a very interesting thing and in realizing, oh, wow, we're able to implement these policies that end up helping other people too, even if we're not always cognizant of it. And to help kind of wrap us up a little bit, because I know that somehow time flies, I want to talk about the future for just a minute and think about how we have all these things that we view as especially with neurodivergent people as deficits, that maybe our interests are strange, or maybe we're just so blunt that it comes off as rude. What if we instead frame these things as this person's an expert, or this person is just really honest? And what if we thought about even how by adapting to a world that is often inaccessible or not designed with us in mind, we're in fact just really creative. 
and we're really detail oriented or focused or any of these things that these are some of the different strengths that are associated with neurodivergence and autistic people in particular too. I believe this was from an autism resource, but I think it was really interesting is instead of focusing on those deficits and perceived deficits, we think of that strengths-based approach. It's so easy for people to ask, like I said, what is difficult for me? rather than think about what's not difficult or what I'm actually good at or what I feel comfortable with or what I excel at. And I wish that more of the strengths of neurodiversity were celebrated more often. To kind of help send us home, I want to talk about some things that we can do to be a little bit more inclusive each day and every day. Something that I absolutely love is that we can trust each other, essentially, and be a little bit more open and vulnerable. If you are someone who is perceived as being in power and you are marginalized or you are also neurodivergent, you opening up in some way is so big and possibly inspires other people to do the same. I teach a college course in the spring usually with undergrads and every semester there's somebody with a disability who is ashamed, gives me the form for accommodations. I don't think anything of it. First day of class, I always do an icebreaker of like, why did you sign up for this? And I tell them about my, my story and my journey and the same kid who handed me the form the day before ends up telling the whole class, like, oh, by the way, I have a learning disability and I am very similar to the professor and that's why I took this class. And I realized that's because I made them feel safe. So us learning to trust each other makes other people feel safe. I also want us to go beyond the stereotypes and let people do things they actually like and that they are passionate about and care about. There is a big stereotype in autism that we are all computer geniuses. So my first legal job loved me doing all the tech based tasks, like kind of like hiding at the computer, like a little gremlin in the basement. And what I really wanted to do was litigate. I wanted to work on the memos. I wanted to do the research. I wanted to do all the exciting stuff of litigation. But instead I was doing all these like very technical spreadsheets. I was doing lots of doc review, but I was not the only first year associate. And the other first year associate was going to court and doing cool stuff while I was in the basement being the one who can analyze all the documents. It was stressful because, and I also ran the website at the time too. So I was basically the tech person and it made me very frustrated because that was not something I was very good at, but it was based on a stereotype. But when I finally got to do more research and litigation based tasks and writing and things that I was good at and actually enjoyed, I was a lot happier and it made my life a lot easier too. So whatever it is, whether it's something that you're interested in, whether it's something that you do in your work life, just try to stick with your passions and hope other people do that and look beyond the stereotypes. One of the easiest things we could do was communicate with each other intentionally and meaningfully. One secret that I have when I work with new people, because I manage people, is I, is I ask them to tell me three different things about themselves to best work with them. For instance, if you work with me, I'm going to give you three bullet points. One, I'm not a morning person. Two, unprompted phone calls. Don't do it. It makes me anxious. And three, Please do not think you are bothering me if you need to send me a follow up email. I would actually appreciate it. And all three of those things don't tell you much about why my brain does what it does, but it tells you here's how you can be more inclusive of my brain. And I'm willing to bet if you do this with a partner or someone that you've worked with or even someone in like a study group or something, you'd be really surprised about what you don't know about your own friends and the people that you love and care about too. It's really fun. It's a really quick, like, little thing to do, especially for those of us who are faculty and attorneys and all that, like, just think about what kind of needs everybody has, because every single one of us has access needs to be able to participate in work or an activity or something of that nature as well. The biggest thing that I would love to see more of, too, is this idea of universal design. So when we have our products, buildings, et cetera, to be accessible to anyone forever, if we design with disability and neurodiversity in mind, it usually just benefits all of us. Think about our closed captions. I know we love to talk about closed captions. I personally like closed captions because I am a visual learner. I love watching them on TV because I also know what song is playing in the background or if it's going to be like a super sarcastic thing happening because I'm very bad at picking up on sarcasm. Our English language learners also benefit from them. If you see captions on Instagram, it really helps a lot of people in stories because a lot of us keep our phones on mute to be respectful in public. All sorts of things that might benefit us even if we're not deaf or hard of hearing who are the original audiences for closed captions something i do in this whole like making my little space accessible thing is i always leave stress balls on my desk especially when i had to see clients and when i was in practice and stuff because there was always someone who was more nervous than me who benefited from it and it was like judgment free zone i had fidgets on my desk you want to play with them by all means and to help kind of send us home something that i want us to do 
is think about mentorship and leadership. So I know as a young attorney with a disability and someone who was neurodivergent, I have struggled my entire career to find good mentors. I didn't know anyone like me. It made me feel really awkward a lot of the time. And even at this point in my career, it's still something that I kind of struggle with. But I do also think that having us leading different initiatives, letting us get involved in organizations or bar service or whatever it might be is really important. I was very proud to have spent two years in service on the Florida Bar Young Lawyers Division Board of Governors. I truly enjoyed it. I loved getting to help make them a little bit more accessible. I've worked on mentorship CLEs with the Florida Bar as well. Like I've done all sorts of really fun stuff in this vein. But what I really want to see is that leadership too. A lot of the times inclusions looked at as a checkbox item, not something that's a commitment. I've also been to many, many different neurodiversity trainings at major companies. I've also consulted on them before. And a lot of the times they're neurotypical people telling me how to act more normal and how to assimilate into culture. When really this is all a big two way street that we have to understand each other and be a little bit more empathetic as well. And after all, we do need different kinds of brains and different kinds of minds working together. And I think we can truly have a more inclusive legal profession and school community together. I'm so excited. And again, I'm really thankful for everyone's time. If you have to run off because you're busy, totally understand. If you feel shy and want to ask things offline as well, then you don't want to ask in front of all your friends and colleagues, or you just don't feel comfortable or you think of a question later, Please feel free to reach out to me. Please send me an email, a LinkedIn request, a Facebook message, Twitter, Instagram. I genuinely don't care. Do what feels most accessible to you. I want to be someone that you can trust and hopefully answer your questions if I can. Just mention that we met here tonight because my inbox, again, is kind of a black hole. And I usually hear from a lot of interesting people and I want to know how I know you. So please say hello in that case. I'm looking forward to getting to answer some of your questions and keep this discussion moving. So thank you again for listening to what I have to say and let's keep this conversation going. All right, so how about questions? It's okay if you're shy, don't worry. And we so appreciate you with everything that you had to say. That was, that was so interesting. So I, I'm gonna ask you a question, Haley. Okay. Um, you know, we we deal a lot with um, um, bar passage rates, right, as a law yeah. school. And um, we struggle, I think, with helping our students uh, who have been given accommodations during law school in getting those accommodations on the bar exam. Mm -hmm. any, any advice, any thoughts about that? Oh, my gosh. The, so, I ended up foregoing accommodations when it came to the bar because I did not get them in law school. I have a lot of feelings about why I did not get them in law school. I wish that I had fought harder from it knowing what I know now. One of the biggest things with the accommodations process at the bar is that you have to have a lot of documentation that what you got in law school or what you got perhaps even on the MPRE or the LSAT is not guaranteed to you at the bar. What you need to know also is that you have different types of options for accommodation. So something I didn't know for a very long time is that I had options that were not extra time. The only thing I ever got op offered on the basis of autism was extra time. I never needed extra time. I didn't know that I could have requested, say, a quiet room to take the bar if I wanted. I didn't know I could have requested note taking when I was in law school because I thought that that was for other people. I was essentially told in a way, like, if you don't have a reading disability, you don't need this note taking thing. Or if you don't have a writing based disability, like, I didn't realize how extensive that really was or what I could have done. So I think there's an awareness component to that. And also the bar is very case by case on that. It's not always fair. What really needs to happen, and I know that this is something that I would love to see, not just the Florida Board of Bar Examiners take up, but I think NCBE needs to take up too is reevaluating the test from a universal design standpoint. So then the need for accommodations doesn't necessarily exist as much. So maybe having more, giving everybody ample time, maybe that we do have booklets with slightly larger print in them, or that you can take it all computer-based or that the remote option, I didn't take a remote bar exam. I don't know how much of a disaster that was from, but from what I heard it was, it was a mixed bag to say the least. 
that maybe that might be a more accessible option for some folks. I think it really is an equity issue that we aren't necessarily equipped to properly address. And I wish that the FBBE had at least one representative on that board who has received an accommodation before. I don't know if they ever did, but they need to have at least one person who does identify as having a disability publicly, I think, on that board at any given time, just because I think the needs of disabled students do go unmet. And there's a lack of empathy towards that because we do view these accommodations, unfortunately, as something that's ridden with stigma and some unfair advantage when really we're just trying to level the playing field. Great, great. I feel like that's a very big answer to a question oh, that there's no that's perfect good. answer. Or Jeanette and I are both giving you thumbs up on that one. <laughs> Because that's what we've been preaching for a long time too. I have so. a lot of feelings about the bar and I have a lot of feelings about how FBBE operates. I think it's really, I wish there was a lot more transparency to be quite honest with you. But I really do think there needs to be somebody with a disability at the decision making table because we often aren't at the decision making table in most situations, especially one where you can tell that students are essentially being denied on um, gatekeeping alone. And I think that the bar admissions process as a whole does a huge disservice to students with disabilities, especially if you have a mental health or psychiatric or cognitive disability. So, um, Constance just sent a, a, a interesting question. Have you ever heard of autistic people being given accommodations on probation or parole in the criminal legal system? I don't know for sure, but the second half of the question is how can convicted persons access right. accommodations? And there's actually a lot of really interesting stuff on this is that convicted folks with disabilities are entitled to accommodations under the Americans with Disabilities Act as well. There's a really great chapter on prison accommodations that I still vaguely remember reading about two years ago from Elizabeth Kelly's book about representing people on the autism spectrum in like criminal proceedings or like defendants. I have to get the name of the book down straight, but it's by Elizabeth Kelly. A lot of her work is absolutely fantastic. Let me put her name in the chat for you guys that she does a lot of really wonderful work in this space, but you can get accommodations. Something that I also feel a little nervous about when we talk, when we immediately jump to autistic and neurodivergent people in prisons. A fun fact is that there are Disability is very overrepresented, especially IDD as well in the prison populations, but we are also more likely to be victims of crimes than we are to be the perpetrators. That's something that I feel like gets lost a lot as we always focus on that one like autistic defendant who did something that's absolutely off the wall and not the fact that there are plenty of women with IDD who, for instance, might be assault victims or that we might be more likely to be profiled or all these other things. So there's so many access to justice issues here that I wish we had time to unpack. And honestly, it would be cool to just teach an entire class on neurodivergent access to justice issues, because that would be my like dream in life, to be quite honest, because there's so much there that we could talk about. Oh, that is really, really interesting. If, if you can ever make that happen, I would love to do it. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, Daniela, who I think you know. I know, Daniela. Uh, I miss you, Daniela. Hi. She um, is asking about empowering employees to request disability accommodations from their employers. Oh, my gosh. I think it's just having that lack of shame. And I think something that happens as well for a lot of folks is they get the information when they're onboarded and then they don't get it again. And I think that's really paramount for folks who might be diagnosed later in life, who might not feel comfortable right away because it's a culture shift. There's a huge culture that comes with it. So I think what a lot of large companies do very well is they might have something like an employee assistance plan that might be a safer way to be able to bust some of the stigma or get help privately with different things. Or even something that I know that goes really well in a lot of the big places as well as things like affinity groups and employee resource groups or business resource groups, whatever they call them. And usually there is one that is disability or mental health based. And usually if the, the way that it's described, some of those ERGs are written really loosely that it can be for people with disabilities or allies, parents of kids with disabilities, et cetera. And you have a very large cross section of people who care about those causes. And I think that is a huge way to get support. So I think it peer, I think peer support's huge. I also think that when companies make a dedicated statement or something in their literature about accommodations or inclusion, that's really big. 
I think about even when I was applying for summer associate jobs, I didn't know where to even find any information on disability. Like it wasn't included in their diversity metrics. And if you were lucky when it said like women and minorities are encouraged to apply, you were lucky if disability even was mentioned. Yet people with disabilities more broadly are the largest minority group in the United States, if not the world. And it's the only minority group that you can join at any point in your life by being alive, essentially, that eventually you might get old and you might develop some kind of medical condition or something like Alzheimer's dementia, if you're lucky enough to be alive a long time. And some of us were just born that way. So I think disability, just how it gets treated is a whole other can of worms there. But I think that we need to just, and I think even when it comes to requesting accommodations, People don't do it for a variety of different reasons. They might have a self accommodation system. They don't feel safe disclosing. I think that's such an individualized question at the same time that there is no real perfect answer. Great. Anybody else? Join the conversation. Got a question? These have been some great questions. All right. Well, seeing none. We're going to uh, end our conversation tonight, and we just really appreciate you, um, Haley, for being here. And all of our participants, we appreciate you being part of this conversation. It's such an important conversation for us to have as a law school.